tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed. And a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to tinfoil hat. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. <laughs> Eric, open your mind. <laughs> Good morning, Swarm, and welcome to Tim Fall Hat. You know I am, you know I'm here to do, I'm here to rock. Join me as always, Xavier Guerrero, and on the ones and two, Jay Nice, Johnny Woodard. How are you, Johnny? Uh, I'm all right, man. We we lost our family dog uh, today, so I'm a little little dragon. But I'm sorry about that. No, Rest so in good. peace, family dog. Yeah. R.I.P. O.P. R.I.P. O.P. Yes, okay, the first one that died being treated like a real human being. Congratulations. Yeah, it was, I told Sam earlier. He's the first dog we had that was lived in the house. There's oh. a special kind of psychopath that makes their dog stay outside the whole time. How well, no, I mean we live on a farm, dude. They have they love it. They well, you know, like we have we have mostly big dogs, and they just run in the fields. It's it's a wonderful life for them. Believe me, it's a lot better than living in the house. But for you a don't small, think the dogs want to come in the house but when we, it's cold. We have, dude. We have like a a house for them outside that has heated heated lamps and oh, stuff. Oh snap! She didn't tell me that they got their own condo. Yeah, yeah. Oh <laughs> shit! Maybe they are living a better but life. The, the only reason the corgi is in the house really is because we have coyotes and stuff and wild dogs. A, a smaller dog would would not we'll survive. Just get so. annihilated. Yeah. Xavier, how was you? Uh, you had your birthday celebration yes, last was, week. Yes, I, yeah. Did you actually go to dinner with the money I gave you? Yes, did you I, spend yeah, it on yes. oh, dinner, sushi. Thank you, at Katana. Yeah, no problem. Oh, look at that, yeah, going hard in the pain. I did. I did. It, it, it was a pretty. It was a pretty little little gift. So I had to go hard in the pain. All right, thank good. You, you deserve. Appreciate it. it. Thank fancy, you. Thank fancy, you. Fancy, Even though you fancy. didn't come to my daughter's birthday party, but that's okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, we're going on, guys. I hope you guys are enjoying these shows. We're cranking out greatness. Uh, this episode's uh, just a great one. We have Chance on, and uh, Chance is from what is Chance from the what the what's the name is the Interverse podcast. Chance Garton, and uh, he goes deep and gets really into. I mean, I feel like this is a deep conversation. This is what I felt yeah. was a very black belt conversation, and I hope you guys can enjoy it. Uh, I enjoyed it. It leaves you with a lot of uh, questions. And at the end of the day, you kind of just, it's an old saying, the more you learn, the less you know. Yeah. Right? It's never truer than today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to see me live, listen, the Weirdo Tour is about to kick off in full fact. Is that what you're naming it? Yeah, the Weirdo the Tour. The Weirdo Tour? Because I'm going to shoot special. So, uh, you know, it's like I just shot, I just did a sh set at this little room over here. You know how I hate doing LA show. So a buddy of mine invited me to this little room. It's about 30 people gorgeous i'm like this is fun this is this reminds me of being at the comedy store when it was dead and you could work out shit you know so i'm I, i'm gonna shoot a special soon i just gotta figure out where i want to shoot it when i want to shoot it i'm not doing anything big i'm just doing a tiny little show dropping hammer of the gods and doing that so uh the whole point is that the weirdo tour that's gonna be the name of my special weirdo and i don't even care if anyone else does it it's the name it's there i'm going with it Suck it, okay? Uh, if you want to see me live, I'm going to be in New Jersey, February 16th through the 18th at the Dojo of Comedy, the premier New Jersey comedy club. And then uh, the world-famous comedy store. I'm going to be there uh, at, for Comedy Chaos Live, putting the shows together, hoping and a-praying. Hoping and a-praying. The lineups are great. We sell it out every time. Everyone's like, this is the greatest episode. This is the greatest show ever. And then I have to go. Please do my show. Here's a ton of money. It's funny. It's the best, but it's very stressful when during for Sam during like Monday and Tuesdays, he's making phone calls left and right, left and right, hugged. begging people to do my the greatest <laughs> show on planet Earth, the greatest show on planet Earth, and I have to beg you to do it. Uh, Spokane on the twenty fourth, and Tacoma on the twenty fifth. Then I'm in Bloomington uh, at the House of Comedy May second through the fourth, uh, and then I got more dates coming out. More dates are coming. If you, if you know anybody, you want daddy to come to, near you, give me a contact at your local club. If they do door deals, we'll do it. And then real quick, premium content. I have so many shows. For $15, you get two 
uh, conspiracy social clubs, two uh, Tim Fall hats uh, a week. That's four episodes a week, plus free shows, plus first look at Broken Sim, plus we don't smoke the same. And then go check out the Patreon at uh, Cash Daddies, ca- Patreon dot. Patreon.com slash Cash Daddies. If you're looking for financial advice in these crazy times to make money, how is Howie doing, Johnny? Uh, Howie is has been crushing it lately. Uh, you know he's always uh, he's always ahead of things. And now listen, if you, if you don't check it out, go there now. If you don't like money, don't go to it. Yeah, that's exactly. Just don't. Right. If you don't like money and you don't like being told exactly what to do and how to do it, don't go there. If you like making money. Twenty dollars make you holler. Thousand dollars, Johnny and I will watch you yeah. make love. Twenty dollars make you holler. Thousand dollars will watch you holler. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. So, a uh, great show today. Go check it out. A lot of great stuff's coming on, and we'll get into uh, other stuff. But enjoy the show. We go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. All right, let's get into it. This guy's been on uh, some of my other podcasts, one of them being uh, Zero, and I think you're also on the Union on the Unwanted, if I am correct. I'm very excited to have a mom. We had a great conversation about tuning forks before, which is something I wanted to get into and wanted to buy that you could heal through vibrations, which I'm 100% into. His podcast is Interverse Podcast. Please welcome Chance Garten. How are you, buddy? Hey, Sam, good to talk to you again. And uh, never been on Union of the Unwanted, but I did do zero twice. So maybe that's what you're thinking okay, of. Okay, okay. So I'm really we got deep uh, into having, the tuning stuff. I'm missing left and right. I fucked up your your uh, your, your <laughs> last name when I was going over. I fucked up your podcast and I, I messed up whatever podcast you've been on. So, but we're happy to have you here at Tim Fall Hat, the big one. Thank you for joining us. For our listeners that didn't hear you on uh, the Union on the Unwanted, uh, because you were never on it, would you like to uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your podcast and where our listeners can find you? Yeah, I'll just start with where they can find me. My show is at innerversepodcast.com. I'm on YouTube. Like yourself, I'm on Rockfin. Got a ton of great content on there and uh, premium stuff, free stuff, whatever you want to get into is probably there in terms of the esoteric or the woo covering a lot of things related to healing, but on more of the sort of spiritual, how the emotional body can influence the physical body. I myself am a tuning practitioner like I uh, like you alluded to. Got a giant tuning fork right here. We can touch on, you know, what that entails a little bit. You know, um, my my real specialty is in the technology of language and how language can either show us our innate capacities as infinite, you know, creator beings with divine sparks, or it can enslave us by limiting our ability to imagine outside of a preconceived box. So I like to go deep on etymology, philology, showing how the roots of all the spiritual traditions and mythologies and even ancient history traces back to the oldest language that we know anything about, which is the scripture and the stars, constellations, asterisms, astrotheology, as the Reverend Robert Taylor of the 19th century called it. And yeah, we can go anywhere from, from there, it, but those are my specialties, I think. I love all this, man. And, you know, so there's a clip going around right now that is uh, of Joe Rogan talking about how when you f- try to find conspiracy in everything, uh, it's very dangerous. And, you know, again, obviously, I'm very much on the record for my love of Joe, you know. But that sentiment has been said by many people many times. And I have a real problem with that. And the, the problem I have with that is it makes, it makes people who have been studying stuff, like all the way back to the stars, look like crazy people. Because reality is everything is a conspiracy. My my, what I would what well, what I would change about Joe's statement is: listen, everything is a conspiracy. If you get lost in every conspiracy, you're going to be miserable. And what's the point of trying to save humanity if you're miserable in this world? So so it's like to sit there and go like, oh, you're is everything a conspiracy? Yeah, it literally is. It goes back to our Earth. I mean, it goes back to our ear. Air, our food, 
History. And, and our history, our language, our medicine, the why men and women are constantly at war, why, uh, you know, we got into the last episode, but why the Grammys were so satanic, all that stuff. It's just like, is everything a conspiracy? 100%. Here's my new thing. Why are they getting rid of cursive? If you're asking me, <laughs> because that's how you manifest. Curse is a big part of writing down your fucking, the things you want to manifest in your life. You're talking about just cursive or t even at all? Well, I don't, writing. I don't know, writing. Cursive writing. Cursive well, you don't have to write cursive, but that's a big part. Like, that's how most people journal. Nobody's like, A, B, you write in cursive. That's how a lot of people journal. That's a big part of manifestation. You get that way. What are you texting, manifesting? I mean, people just don't do it. It's writing down the words. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but that is the big way that people do it. So well, that's just the word right. Right and right. R I T E R I G H T W R I T E. You know, did you write your right right? <laughs> I've actually I found this uh, funny, funnily enough, on a like German made notebook at Barnes Noble. And I was like, oh, I got to grab this quote. And I wrote it on the front of my own notepad where I, you know, keep all my information to try to get it all straight. But it said writing by hand is thinking on paper. Thoughts grow into words, sentences, and pictures. Memories become stories. Ideas are transferred into projects. Notes inspire insight. We write and understand, learn, see, and think with the hand. So I think there is something big about writing stuff by hand. I, I remember there was like a list of stuff that I wrote at the, in my journal at the beginning of last year that some of them were seemingly way out of reach, things that I wanted to achieve or acquire in the coming year. And uh, about 80% of it came true, <laughs> you know, like with, pl enough, enough that, you know, that leftover we can work on this year, but I don't know who's, I don't know who's paying Joe to say stuff like conspiracies make you crazy. Uh, oh, I don't he think that has I, said I don't so think many things can. in the past where he proved that he knew some shit about, you know, vaccines or the moon or whatever, and then backtracked on so much of it. I don't even, I always thought that like, once you came over to the light side on certain forms of information, that it was a one way conversion and you couldn't go back. But yeah, I, the biggest conspiracy theory though, if you go all the way to the end of the rabbit hole, in my opinion, is the uh, is actually a big relief. You find out nobody's in charge. <laughs> it's just I'm gangs, you, you know, fighting each other. There's no actual like big bad demiurge master of the universe there to loose you and make your life living hell. It's just you looking at you in the mirror, and you know what are you going to do next? I, I think that's all so interesting. I mean, that is the question. I, I had a great discussion with a, a young lady named Morgan Marshall yesterday on Zero. And, you know, she's super young, gorgeous, and just, like, on this journey. And, you know, it's like we were just talking about, like, it, it's kind of fun watching somebody early on in their journey trying to discover everything that you chance are talking about. And, you know, I just, I, I, I think sometimes in this world we think that we can get to the center of the rotten onion. And I just don't think you can. I don't think there is a center. And I think if there was a center and there was a power force behind it, that we would be shown this center. I do believe that there are the light and dark, the laws of duality, and they are constantly battling over your, 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 your attention. And what you well, want attention to is the key word you just said there, Sam, because the center is everywhere because the center is the indivisible life force energy that animates all matter and all biology. So the real war, if you will, is on consciousness or for attention. And that means that the battleground that's being fought for the center that's being contested is in you. It's your own attention. Totally what are you going agree. to pay attention to? I completely and utterly agree. And that gets into manifestation and, and manifesting the need for them to save you. That's all they've ever done. That is what every single false flag is about, is manifesting you to demand that they save you. Big bad, big, big bad meanies out there. So you need the government to come and stop big bad meanie. And if that means giving up a lot of your freedoms to be safe, then guess what? You better do it.
So here, it's always that the same people get all the money, all the power, all the same thing, all the time. It is statistically impossible for the same people to get it all the time. And you could go, okay, Sam, what about the Revolutionary War? What about when the Americans took took the country from Britain? Well, then you go, you're assuming that the British are the ones who are in control. When in reality, there's most likely bankers at the top who are working the strings on both sides and that they want to take control of America because America is brand new or the America that we know of that we are taught, which isn't necessarily the real America, but the one they want us to believe in because it's this limited hangout, right? They want you to believe that, 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 Christopher uh, Columbus discovered America when most likely there were Moors and Vikings and natives here way before that. But they, but because Christopher Columbus was their guy, they want you to believe he did it. So the, the purse strings are there pulling so that the, uh, the Freemasons Luciferians were took over uh, the country from the, the, the monarchy of Britain and created a new system here in which these bankers could fully and utterly control, manipulate. So, I mean, it might go back to like elementary. Like, does that go back to the Boston Tea Party? Goes back to money. All, all back the, to money. Everything goes back to bankers. Good shit. argument, man. That every single revolution ever was funded by the same people. Well, let's uh, let's take Christopher Columbus as an example of how the language, if you know the keys to the system, the universal system of mythology, language, and you could actually look at things that are called ancient history and throw a lot of doubt on whether or not it ever even happened. So Christopher Columbus, that's <laughs> Christopher. That name means farrier or carrier of the Christ which is, you know, the savior, redeemer, that whole mythos goes back to Krishna. Uh, there's a lot of versions of Christ and in, in mythology that are identical. But then his last name, Columbus, <laughs> Colomb, Colomb is the Latin word for heaven and Colomb is a, a dove. And so if you have a few ideas in your mind about what the roots of the whole mythology of the Trinity and of the savior are based in, it actually goes back to the mythos of the ark and the great flood. And we could get into the, the deep end of exactly what that mythos is about, but suffice to say, it is a story of the God, the father (laughs) as the master, the, the phallus on the boat, the mother goddess as the boat itself, the hull or the hole hole in the hole mast in the, the mast in the boat, the uh, phallus in the Yoni, and then the Christ figure rides on the boat. And what was the name? What was the name of his boat? The Santa Maria. Yep. Oh, that's Saint Mary. <laughs> that's Mary, Mother of God, Mother of Christ. And so that entire narrative of him coming over here and discovering the Americas probably a cover up of the fact that whatever this corporation is that runs things and has, you know, changed its its uh, CEOs and its branding over the centuries starting out as, you know, or going back to the Phoenicians and then the Roman Catholic church or the Holy Roman empire taking over that. And then whatever it is now <laughs> that they probably had access to the Americas way before and were aware of the fact that the Americas were actually using the exact same system of mythology, astrotheology, constellations, etc., and even that their languages were very similar. The uh, Mexican language before the conquistadors showed up has so much affinity to the Hebrew that it's, you know, it's statistically impossible that they didn't come from the same source. Yet we get this story of like, oh, they were just savages, and then, you know, we killed them all off accidentally with smallpox blankets. Another psyop. <laughs> I couldn't germs. agree more. In terms of that whole story of blankets and all that, it's just it's just like So you think they murdered them, murdered them, and they're using the whole smallpox as in like we're not that Yeah, evil? they came over here and murked people once they're once they got exposed that these lands were here. They had to uh, cover up the fact that their system pre existed in these lands because otherwise 
you know, they wouldn't even like when the conquistadors were doing their thing, they wouldn't let people over here that had any level of literacy at all, not allowed to come over here until after everything was burned to the ground. Cause it would have revealed the fraud, you know, the, uh, the conquistadors, the Spaniards, they were literally the, the military arm of the Holy Roman empire at that time and era in history. Yeah. And it had to be covered up. Otherwise it completely pulls the rug out from under their entire authority system, which is based in the historicity of Jesus Christ and, passing on the the uh, mantle of CEO of Christ Corp to St. Saint, Saint Peter, also a fictional character, et cetera. ADAs, uh, there is so much going on right now with everything you're saying. And again, you know, we have to do this every time we talk about this. And I'm going to be honest with you, the listeners are really good at understanding these are just conversations. And, you know, everybody should believe what they want to believe so that they are they treat their fellow human beings with love and respect and make the world a better place. So these are just this, because to me, this discussion goes into why are they lying to us about everything? And again, it gets into limited hangouts, but it's really about not letting you know how powerful you are and that you are just a victim of circumstances that you're this great and good person. You're just a good person and just the world is conspiring against you. I can't tell you guys all the shit I've gone through this over this last two weeks. It is, it is insanity that it's all going on at one time. And if I was, if this was me three years ago, before recovery, before zero, before my children, before all that stuff, I would be convinced the universe is conspiring against me to make me miserable. And what I understand now is that things are happening to me because I need to learn lessons in life because I have to change my behaviors in certain ways because bigger things are coming. And I am preparing for something bigger so I have tools in my tool belt to deal with these situations. I am not a victim and I am in fact... The center of everything going on in my life, and I am the I am the I am the hero of my movie, and the only one that can save me is me. So I have to deal with this shit, first respond it head on. But what everything else that we're lied to is like you were born into this world, this world is shit, you have no say over it, and you just some people get the breaks, some people don't. Blah wah 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 blah blah wah wah baby. And that's not it. Okay, and this is why they're lying to you about all this stuff. This is why they're lying to you about words. This is why they want you to say words that are magic, that are actually fucking pu putting spells on you in your life. That's my opinion. Words are very important. Hey, guys, real quick, I want to tell you about Factor. They're healthy, ready-made meals delivered right to your doorstep, okay? This is a new year. You got goals, and Factor is here to help you achieve each and every one of them fuel up fast with ready nutritional meals delivered straight to your door, leaving you time and energy to tackle other things on your to-do list. Achieve and maintain your 2023 goals with Factor. Get America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit and start saving time, eating well, and living your best life, okay? If you're too busy to cook with Factor, skip the trip to the grocery store and skip the chopping, the prepping, and the cleaning. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are, are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat up and enjoy. And listen, I'm telling you, this saved my life. When my babies were young, two twins running and gunning, I loved, I loved Factor, man. I ate great, I lost weight, and I felt good. Okay? So here's what I want you guys to do. It's real simple. Get Factor and enjoy eating without the hassle. Simple. Simply choose your meals. Enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes. It's just that simple. With 34 chef-prepared, dietitian-approved weekly options, there's always something new to try. Plus, you can round out your meals and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 36 sweets, smoothies, juices, and more satisfying add-ons. Okay, so here's what we want you to do. Head to factorsmeals.com slash tinfoil50 and use the code tinfoil50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code tinfoil50 at factormeals.com slash tinfoil50. 
FOIL50 to get 50% off your first box. What you just said about the things in your life being there to teach you lessons couldn't be more correct. That especially this becomes evident once you study the biofield anatomy, which is the system I use whenever I'm doing remote tuning sessions for people, which is just really profound because it gives it gives the client the experiential knowing that everything is everything, that separation and distance are mental concepts, not an actual reality. I'm waving a tuning fork around in my living room while we're on a Zoom call. I'm not even looking at them. And I can tell them like, oh, you've had your mother abandoned you when you were three or you've had problems. You broke your ankle several times in your life or whatever. And the crazy thing is you can get it right because there's an actual informational high structure to the energy that is around your body. And then that energy, which is prana or life force is not separate from anyone else's prana or life force. And if they're tuned into their body and they're asking it questions with the right language, with the right ability to get an answer back, then you can get the, you can get the information very specific. It's, it's pretty amazing. And so I think that like, you know, to connect this back to what I was saying regarding astro theology and language, the biggest help you can do for yourself is to stop looking at the world as like random chaotic events that are external to you and to recognize that everything that happens is a everything that maybe not everything that happens everywhere all the time at once, but everything that is within your field of awareness, your windows of perception is a direct reflection and in, in identical in meaning to what's going on in your inner world. It might not be identical in, you know, uh, in appearance right, a bit, right away. But if you just learn to like interpret the symbolism of what's going on in your life, the way that somebody would interpret dreams, this is why like so many of the prophets in the Old Testament were dream interpreters. That's a metaphor for life interpreters. You know, these augers, they're looking at birds flying by and they're like, okay, there's this many birds. And that means don't march your army out today because the horses will get stuck in the mud or, you know, really weirdly specific stuff. But that's actually how this reality works. Everything is everything. And if you have the symbolic literacy, which is equal to psychic self-defense when it comes to, you know, parasitic forces that are maybe attempting to manipulate you, which are actually representatives of your own innate obstinacy and stubbornness and willful ignorance of your own state and your own imbalances. Uh, like not, nothing comes at you and tries to manipulate you. If, if you're the one keeping an eye on yourself and keeping everything straight and level, you know, guiding your own path. Uh, what happens external of you is there is no such thing external of, of you. And that's, I think, what really helps people get out of a rut is to realize that. Well, it's, uh, uh, you know, again, and here we go, where they take these amazing things like the Hermetic Principles and scumbags, like, you know, these, these dark arts occultists, take them, flip them. So when you go, when you go, oh, so above, so below, oh, Elster Crowley, bro, oh, my God, you're, 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 you're in the Moloch and all that shit. It's like, no, dude, that's an old principle that he hijacked. And it is like the, the, the world around you is a reflection of what's going on inside you. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you change yourself, you change the people around you and everything around you. It's the conversation I was having last night. When you do higher vibrational stuff, higher vibrational people are attracted to you. And when you do lower vibrational stuff, lower vibrational people are attracted to you. It's funny because it goes back to who your parents tell you. Who you hang out with is who you are. That's a oh, great that's so true. Yeah. I, think kid, like, I remember hearing that when I was a kid. Like, stop hanging out with that. You're going to become that just like that motherfucker. No, I'm I, not. You know, I think about that all the time now. Like, the people around me, like, I just love misfit toys. And it just bites me in the ass constantly. It constantly blows up in my face. All the freaking time. That means you're a nice person. I get it. Because those people, like you, the ones you've taught me, we know who we're talking about, and they needed some help. No, I. They get would have it. been in shitty. They were already in a shitty situation. Yeah, you you can help them yeah. out. Sometimes yeah. you can't turn yourself into Christ either, though. I mean, yeah, true. I mean, I'm not Christ consciousness at all, but I'm trying. I'm trying. It's like the women, though. We all have women in our lives who keep <laughs> trying to date their way out of a situation. You know what I mean? Like, and they keep dating the same kind of guy, though. And they're like, I don't know why. I just keep dating this certain pattern of guy. And, and and I think if you thought about it, like you know, internalizing it, like I uh, talked to a friend of mine the other day. I'm like, yeah. he's still dating felons. Yeah. She's like, it's so addictive. I'm like, 
What are you doing? <laughs> right. And like, did we have people listen to this who are felons? Let's, you know, you made mistakes before. You know, you made mistakes right. before. But they're probably not going to keep dating other felons. You know, they're trying to move on. Yeah, from that. I mean, yeah. if you've made a change, like, I own my shit. Like, I, that's why I talk about everything that I do openly. Because you're only as sick as your secret. So I talk about openly. So if you're a felon and you listen to this, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah, no I, offense. I didn't mean it like that. Because I have good friends of mine who I love very much who have made giant changes in their life. And they, you know, they and I guess now they're like a sponging felons, which is kind of cool, giving people a chance to, you know, change their lives and stuff like that. But you are, you, yeah, who you hang out with is who you are, basically. And yeah. there's a lot of people I know that are really good at cutting people out. And I go, man, like, is that right? I don't think so. But sometimes I'm like, damn, that just cuts out all this drama. It's weird, dude. It's weird. So let's get into uh, a little bit. So you talked a little bit about the human biofield. Can you go a little deeper into that? Yeah, man. So there's a technique in the, in this biofield tuning that I'm describing. I learned this from Eileen Day McCusick. So if people are curious about it, they should go get on my YouTube channel or my Rockfin and or my website and look up episodes with Eileen McCusick. And or just look at things with me and Ding. I have a sound healing tab on the website with a couple of the videos up there, but I talk about it often. The practice is it's kind of like imagine if you were sweeping up the dirt, you know, off of your floor, except the floor is your energy field. And so we have this central column in our body. You could call it, you know, the chakra system. A lot of this biofield tuning is very overlapping with the chakra idea. I mean, we use those words in the practice, but it expands them. So if you have an understanding of what types of energy are at what level of height, you know, in your, in your body, then there's also the axis of the left to the right and the front to the back. So based on where you find stuck energy in someone's biofield, using the tuning fork as like your detection system, you sweep it through the area around their body and you might find a, a snag it's different for different practitioners you, maybe you're listening and you hear the f sound of the fork change or the fork tone starts running out quicker and uh, or for me i actually get you know i get cues in my body usually my ears pop or i feel like a pressure differential in my head and in my ears something clicks is how i i put it and so then i know that like oh i hit the spot i pull the fork out put it in that spot again, I get the exact same reaction. It's scientific, it's mechanical. And then I know that like, okay, we're dealing with the, the right, we're about at the right hip level. And then there's the stuck energy. It is three feet off of the person's body and it is more in the front than in the back. Well, that tells me something very specific. The human energy field is on average about six feet off the body in all directions. And, and that's where you get to the edge of it, the outer membrane. Is that our aura? And so, what's that? Is that our aura? Yeah, yeah. You could call this the aura. It's the same same concept. So it goes it is six the, feet out. Yeah, it goes six feet out. So six wow. feet apart, everybody. You wouldn't want your auras intermingling or anything. Oh, <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. There's this is real. This is real stuff. It's measurable. It's measurable. And when you the what makes this system really interesting is that it constitutes a language for you to communicate with the intelligence of your body and the intelligence of other people's body. So I've got in my mind, I've got this whole system, um, you know, this whole anatomy mapped out. I know what every area would represent and then how far away from the body some stuck energy is will tell you when it happened in their life. So the outer edge of their energy field is like the very outer edge, that stuff that was when they were born. So if I find something six feet away from their body, it's probably when they're a baby or in the womb or just born. And then if it's really close to the body, it's something really recent. So an example would be, you know, say I find three feet away from the body of a 30 year old, something going on that tells me that it happened when they were about 15. And sometimes, you know, the stuck energy pockets can be bigger. They can represent like a, a swath of time rather than a specific moment of trauma. Oh, that's interesting. But, yeah, the, the stuck energy is beliefs about yourself that are limiting. It is feelings, emotions, things like that, that you don't want to face, that you're ignoring. You're literally pushing it off to the side. 
But the thing is, feeling is consciousness. Consciousness is life force. So if you are holding back certain feelings or if you are limiting yourself based on a belief like, I mean, it's sometimes it's silly shit. Like I, I've found people that <laughs> I've, I had, a, I've had clients where I like found where their, their fourth grade teacher called them lazy and they totally forgot that they were told that they were lazy, but at the time they internalized it and believed it. And then that represented like, you know, say 5% of their overall life force energy is now tied up and held back because they think they're lazy. And that means while well, lazy person wouldn't use their whole full effort. Right. So sometimes it's silly. Sometimes it's bigger, more traumatic stuff. Um, but it always represents, you know, whether it's an, an, a feeling or not, it always represents some kind of a belief. Like I can't face that. I can't access that. And it's a survival mechanism. We do this, especially as children, we hold back feelings because we don't want to, our, our body, our intelligence of our mind, it has this innate knowing that like for survival, we can't just sit there and cry all day. We need to uh, you know, go find some food or do our work or whatever. So it's kind of programmed in us like a survival mechanism to do this shunting off to the side of trauma. Yeah. And listen. The, you know, the body does this with all kinds of physical issues as well yeah. in the sense that if your body doesn't have the energy to heal something, then it won't touch. It won't even start. But if it's got the energy to do it, it'll start. So that applies to like why sometimes you'll have a scar for like five years and you get into a healthier phase of life and that scar disappears because now your body had the energy to repair that, but it's not going to start unless it has the energy. So the whole process of biofield tuning to finish it up, like the description up is when I find this stuck life force energy, I click and drag it back to the center so that it, and I tell them, I tell them what it is. So then, then they're able to put their awareness on it and they're able to decide a different belief about themselves, incorporate it back in. And, you know, it's this centropic process of restoring lost life force energy. It's what shamans would call soul retrieval. It gives you more of your full energetic capacitance to, you know, see things through the end. And for people that like, they've got a closet that needs cleaned out and it's been a, a wreck for 10 years or they, they do the laundry, but they just leave it on the bed and don't put it away. <laughs> or like they don't finish unloading the dishwasher. They walk away from it. All these type of little things, they symbolize not having your full energetic capacity in, in play. And then you don't have the throughput to see certain tasks to the end. And that's what this thing tuning can do. Apart from that, it also can help you, you know, heal a lot of issues going on with your body. People will have spontaneous, sometimes even detox experiences after tuning. I'm not saying it's necessarily easy, although it is fun. I had a client a couple of weeks ago who I found, I found his trauma around 9-11 because he was, a, a, he was like in college, I think at the time, 9-11 goes down and he's one of the only people that he knows that saw through it. And he's just like pissed off and he wants to talk to people about what's going on. And he's got all this bile and vitriol, like, fuck them. They, they, they're, they're, they're lying to us. And like, he couldn't express that. So it got held off to the side. It got, you know, that anger got repressed. It set up a pattern of repressing anger and aggression in, in a way that was inappropriate. And when I hit that pocket of stuck energy and I was like, and I get the cue mentally, like when I hit it, it'll, I'll get like a, an insight, a flash of intuition about what it is. Cause that's my body communicating with me about what their body's doing. And I was like, Whoa, Whoa, this is nine 11. <laughs> what happened? And uh, whenever we cleared out the nine 11 trauma with this dude, I swear he started vomiting. And I know that that's not like a good, a good advertisement to get a tuning, but it's the only person I've ever had actually vomit during a tuning to be fair. But it, you know, sometimes the, uh, the energy movement can be intense and immediate. And in that case, it was for him. And, you know, vomiting is not fun. But after this session, he was fine. He wasn't sick or anything. It was just like, that's the way it chose to express itself at that time. And it makes sense because the liver is what holds on to uh, anger energy is where we process anger. And, you know, that bile of unprocessed anger bubbling up as it's finally being released is, you know, made him need to puke and it is what it is, but he wasn't mad about it. it it's just kind of funny. Sorry, bro. Sorry. I threw up all over your place. My bad. Um, well, no, no. He was at his house. I was at my house. Oh, we were just on a zoom. That call. makes it even better. That's amazing. Clean up aisle five. Um, 
I I relate to everything you're talking about, and it's so funny because you know I messed up your last name, I messed up the name of your podcast when we were getting prepared, and it all goes back to me. Re- this is so hilarious because I was reading out loud in school, and I probably talked about this a thousand times on the podcast, but I was reading out loud in school in the fourth grade, and I said devil instead of devil, and the entire class laughed. Now, I'm a comedian. That would normally be a great thing, but that was so traumatic to me that I never read out loud again in school, and it wasn't until I went to recovery meetings where they made me read out loud, and it was the only place I could read out loud that nobody laughed at me. And like, if I mess a word up, they would they would fix they would tell me the correct pronunciation pronunciation without judgment. That I started to learn to read out loud, but I still have that giant fear of butchering. So the, the beginning of the show is the most traumatic part of the show because I'm like, oh no, I gotta get their name right. Let's oh god, thank I, you. I have a story like that. Like same thing. The teacher right out. She got up and she's like, hey, I'm gonna help some of you guys out that need help, but I'm not gonna read out their names. But she read out the story about how my c- uncle had a condo. I wrote condom. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew that my uncle ha- had just bought a condo because I told wait, everybody. Wait, wait, wait are, you, are, you cri- are you cribbing from Rocky? Remember, uh, he's like, I don't. I, I, he's like, you want to invest in condominiums? He's like, no, I never use them. <laughs> That's from Rocky, dude. No, you're still that really Rocky. happened. I'm a I, I, condo, that, condo. That, that like that when you're really a kid, happened to him. like when you're a kid and you try to spell con- condo and you write condom because it just looks the same and you wrote it and she she didn't want to like pronounce it to the class. She didn't say, hey, Xavier wrote it. It was a very like. Hey, for whoever this is, and I remember, like you said, it was trauma. I literally remember, and everyone looked at me, and I was like, "Dude, I'd never want to like write ever again." Yeah, did I? I, I did uh, island. I said is land. So uh, is there land. we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is land. First grade, and people are just like, "Oh, you're so dumb, yeah. dude." Well, you're it's like, even worse because I volunteered to say it. She's like, "Anybody know how to say this?" I was like, "Yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> is land." <laughs> Dude, that's so true, bro. It's crazy. Trauma, trauma. Ne- you'll trauma. never forget any of that shit either. Never. So last night I was watching the. Um, I, was, I, I I just for some reason I'm a glutton for punishment on Netflix docs that cover any conspiracy. Like yeah. you know we had a mo- well, maybe we'll talk about it tonight, but. D.B. Cooper, and like, of course, they had to do that middle part where they're like, and they were all fetishizing these these airline stewardesses, you know, all the while half the really? chicks. Oh, yeah. It was like, you just fast forward it. It's like, move, go, stop, stop, stop. It's like it's almost like they have to do that to get the thing made at this point. Oh, yeah. Like they, have, they have to have woke stuff that women are being oppressed because guys find them hot while half the chicks out there have OnlyFans and they pay their bills by taking pictures of their buttholes and they're like, Oh my God, stop fetishizing me. Right. It's just like, what are we, where are we living? I do think people are waking up to it more and more, but, um, so now they had the Unabomber and you know, again, I was having this woman on zero. She's supposed to come on, uh, before on Tiffle hat, but she wasn't feeling good, but she was talking about what happened to the Unabomber when he was a six month old baby. And it was beyond traumatizing. They strapped him down with no touching for um, seven days. Nobody touched him. And it doesn't sound like a long time, but that's forever when you're for a used. Baby? Yeah, for a baby. Not to get yeah. touched. You have to touch your baby. And he, his mother was like, he never was the same. He never was the same after that. Why'd she let him yeah, do that? Yeah, that would, that would set up a lot of problematic issues in somebody's energy field, but specifically would give them a huge complex over power. Because the mother in your energy field is what teaches you that you are powerful or that you are powerless. And, you know, to not be touched by your mother for a really long time, that's going to set up a, a serious fetish over power where you uh, want to exploit others and demonstrate that you are powerful. And, uh, I mean, I don't know much about the Unabomber story, but... There would be a lot of other issues involved in not being touched for a, a week. That's and definitely going to be a big problem. At six months, it's crazy. He had a he had a uh, like moles or a disease, something like that, where he wasn't he supposed to be touched. Like some yeah. kind of like um, like he just had. Oh, that's why. Yeah, yeah. It was medical. It was medical. He was oh, having like man. high breakouts or something like that. Some kind of rashes. I couldn't wear like some rubber or something all and over his body. It just makes put on no some plastic sense. gloves. I mean, Jesus, what is this? 
It made no sense. And like now you look at him, he lives in a, he's in a solitary confinement all by himself. It was like. Well, that's a perfect example right there of how our trauma that is repressed, we actually will live out that we will recreate that trauma in our life in one form or another. And it'll often come to us from the seemingly from the external, like we had no control over it, but it's actually the message from universe saying, this is what you need to deal with. This is what you need to deal with. So, you know, hope <laughs> him being in solitary confinement is like obviously an exact mirror to what Whoa. you just described about him being a baby. Yes. 100%. It's like that. It's just like that. And like so much of our childhood and it's just like, I love my kids so much. And like one of my biggest goals is not to be the reason they go to therapy if they go to therapy. Right. But it's like, so it's just like little things, man. It's just like you never know what affects them. Is there any moment in your, yet that you've been like, oh, that that's that's gonna affect them in a weird kind of way? Yeah, yet? yeah, that's gonna. No, be, no, 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 not no, in, no. A bad, in a bad, good way. Like, do you remember? Like, oh, this is something well, they're gonna I remember mean, for the rest things. of their life. I, I think, I, I, I think, I, I, I don't want to get into the too personal of it because it's you know, there's a lot. There's not just me involved, but. I am working with my daughter on her words. She says can't a lot. Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about our friends at Copy My Crypto. That's right, our good friend James McMahon. Listen, so many people are making ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest. You simply need to do what he does, okay? So let me tell you about James. He runs Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy cens censorship has over 26,000 subscribers. Good for him. Since March 2020, his he's told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put 100 bucks in each, it'd be worth 123,000, okay? Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, went up 692 times from what he said. The one that one cause retired a number of people including guys in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. You can go to his YouTube and verify this yourself. So if you'd like to join the 2,800 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing and head over to copymycrypto.com slash TFH. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash TFH. That's TFH. You're not only, you'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but my, my listeners will get full access for just a dollar. Once again, that's copymycrypto.com slash TFH. The recession is here, guys. You can suffer like everyone else or choose to thrive. James is the real deal. Go visit the site now. Have you guys ever heard of green language? What's green language? They also call it the language of the birds. But why I bring this up, and I'll explain it. So uh, the word can't in, I think it was a like the 17th or 18th century France. It might have been earlier than that. I don't have notes on it in front of me, but that word was actually used to refer to a duplicitous type of speech in the usage of like mafias, criminals, uh, <laughs> people that were trying to conceal their meaning, but only that only others that knew the Kant language could uh, pick up on what they were talking about. And so they also called it Argo, which is interesting because back to that Christopher Columbus thing, the Argo is the ancient name for the Ark. Ark, Argo in the Indian is called Arga. There are many cities in Greece, uh, in ancient Greece that were called Argus or Argo. The Argonauts, Jason on his quest for the Golden Fleece, which is an astro theological story, all goes back to that. So, you know, there's this thread throughout history of a secret language that sounds like the same language everybody else is speaking, but actually means more than what is on the surface level to people that just take the culturally accepted dictionary, diction of Aries definition, deaf Phoenician. <laughs> and what the, what the green language is, is what I'm describing in your ability to 
read between the lines to pick up on the puns, the wordplay that the universe or life is offering you at all times, or sometimes is uh, deceptively or duplicitously concealing a hidden meaning within a message. And so whenever we are in the sort of left brain mode of consciousness, mechanistic mode of consciousness that most people are led to operate in, at least they were, I think now people are being shunted over into a more right brained, emotional victimhood type of uh, imbalance, generally speaking. But whenever you're able to, instead of just seeing words through their dictionary definition and their culturally accepted mean, you are able to see it in the right brain way and the left brain way at the same time. That's where you start to get into the real goodness of, of being able to demystify the messages of the life force energy, the creative intelligence, the creator, God logos that are coming to you at all times. So the, the green language or the Kant language or Argao or the language of the birds, as it was known is the mystical practice of training your mind to understand the levels of meaning beyond what is overtly intended with a statement. So like I demonstrated with Christopher Columbus, Christopher Columbus being Chris Topher or farrier of Christ and then Cologne meaning heaven and dove in the Latin and that he's on the Santa Maria, that all of that is encoding the Argo or the Ark myth that, that, you know, that's an example of the green language. And once you are able to train yourself to look at life that way, it is very, very helpful to keeping you in that middle between your right and left sides and not leaning too hard on one or the other and getting yourself out of balance. I I'm, I'm into all that. I'm into all of that. You know, one of the, one of the big first shows we had was a story that so much of religion is based off of the stars, but the more all of it. study, but, the, but what I'm saying is that, is it possible that it's in the stars and this stuff really happened. So I don't think so, personally. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe there's examples of where stuff really happened, but that's a great question. The, because what is above so below? And like when we do like your birth chart or your life chart, based on like the stories of your life, based off the stars, there's this kind of parallel between what's going on in your life and what the stars are telling you. So I'm wondering if it's possible that these things maybe didn't have exactly happened that way, but what happened in the stars is a reflection of stuff that's happening on the ground. I think that in a metaphorical sense, that is true. But I don't think in a literal sense it is true. And let me explain a little more. The ancient astronomer Pergis of the you know, the, the cult corporation that has been running the world for a long time. I'm not going to just outright say that their system is evil or bad, but I do think that it's been hijacked by a more mafioso type uh, mentality. And it has been hijacked for a very long time overall, but like in the institution, there's people attempting to work good and evil within it. So we're not just like throwing out the whole system as evil, but what was specifically believed by the ancient world and a really good, really good scholar for demonstrating this is John McHugh. I've had him on my show pretty recently. I hope to have him back on. But he wrote a book called The Celestial Code of Scripture. And he describes all the uh, a few of the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran and some Greek mythology and how it traces back to wordplay within the names of stars and constellations in the ancient Sumerian and Akkadian lexicons. So what he puts forward, and I... I agree with this hypothesis is that was his name. The, his name is John McHugh, M C H U G H. So guys check that out on my, my show. It's a really good episode. Uh, he covers the, we did it around Christmas and he demonstrated the stellar origins of the nativity story of Jesus and why there are two stories of Jesus's birth in the Bible in Luke and one in Mar uh, Matthew and why they're different <laughs> and where all of the specific words of the verses of the Bible are actually word for word in the stars in wordplay. And the reason why the Sumerian language is really good for that is because they have this writing style called cuneiform that required them to use a lot of abbreviations and 
the abbreviations for one word could mean like 12 or 16 different other words. And it was all based in context. And that worked for the astronomer priests because they were the only ones that were literate. So it's not like they needed to use that language for anything other than encoding their mystical stories. And they believed that the wordplay that the reading between the lines, the puns, the homonyms, the synonyms in the names of work of uh, stars and constellations and what they're shaped like, et cetera. So many different, like they're doing this green language thing where they're seeing multiple dimensions of meaning forever for one thing. And then they're expanding on all those multiple dimensions of meaning. And so they did believe in this as above. So below thing that you're talking about in a very literal sense. And I think it was encouraged by their rulership who were also inducted into this or initiated into this uh, priesthood typically that the history of the world or the history of a region could be determined by rolling back the clock of the astro or the sky clock, you know, and that just like judicial astrology uses the movements of the luminaries to predict things that are going to happen in the world and that that was a very important part of their job they also believed that they could project backwards and discover things that truly happened historically by reading between the lines and the constellations and, and names of stars and so there are actually so many examples of what we're given as quote-unquote ancient history and that is very demonstrable astrotheology but I think that this practice of judicial astrology in reverse, where they're coming up with what they believe happened historically based on the stars as well, not just predicting the future. I think this has been going on up until pretty recently, <laughs> actually, and that uh, most of the ancient history of the world, definitely from the supposed time of Christ and earlier, uh, everything before that is pretty much pure astrotheology that I can tell. And so, so, then there's even examples in more recent history that I could point at and say, wow, it's still going on. So we really have very little idea about a true historical narrative of our world. But when you think about it, history is, is fiction anyway, because the only thing you can ever have of history is the story that somebody tells of what happened. And the story is never the reality. The reality is just the present moment that we have now. Even our memories of things that happened in our own life are really more our remembering of the last time we told the story of what happened. You know, how we, we all have had times with family members where we're telling a story of something from long ago and the other family members like, that's not how it happened. I remember this and we're, and we're both sure that we're right. So I kind of reject the concept of history outright anyway, but there are some things that we can not necessarily know, but we can maybe conjecture based on physical real world artifacts and that I'm cool with. But in terms of like texts that are recording ancient history, it's almost for, like everything that I look at, every rock I flip over, I'm like, oh, that's also astrotheology. <laughs> that's also, you know, I can point to the constellations that it's describing. And it's it's uh, fun, though, yeah, because we, it gives you endless conspiracies to unravel. <laughs> and no, no, like you no, can prove that, that it, everything is uh, fake news or fake history. Let me ask you something. Do you believe in the story of the fallen angels? Is that uh, a real story? Because we have Anunnaki, Sumerian texts, all that stuff, uh, archons, all that. Does that resonate with any possibility? Actually, I don't believe in any of that. And let me even go further to say that I specifically have made it a, a quest in my life and on my channels to help people break out of the ultimate form of victim consciousness, which is the belief that like the archons and the demiurge is ruling everything. And, you know, if we wanted to get into it, I could give some pretty helpful explanations of how the Do you believe ancient in doctrines a God? of the mystery. In a God. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's definitely a creator. I mean, that's self-evident, but uh, <laughs> the idea of archons and, and the demiurge and like fallen world and it's a loose farm and all that. I can demonstrate how that is a misinterpretation of the ancient mystery tradition. But to go back to the idea of Nephilim specifically, let me give an example. The idea of Nephilim. Okay, so in my opinion, the greatest way to, the, the easiest, simplest way to explain this quickly is to go back to the story of the Norse creation mythology and the uh, 
the Gananga Gap, if you will, Gananga which is Gap. the yeah, which is the uh, the void or the vortex, the chaos, same as the primordial chaos that the Greeks talked about, from whence everything comes. And if you look up in the stars, there is the I'm doing this off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't have notes on this, but if you look up in the stars, I believe in between the, I believe it's in between the Scorpio and Sagittarius constellations. There is a part of the Milky Way where the band of stars in one on one side between that divide is wider, and on the other side between that divide, it's kind of more narrow. And anyway, this is uh, in the the Norse astro theology. This is Niflheim, and What's the other one? The uh, Niflheim is the ice giant cold half. And then the, uh, I'm blanking, but like where Surtur, the, the fire side, you know, Ben Balderson pro- would probably kill me for not remembering right, this. Right, it's fine. It's uh, fine. But yeah, Niflheim and the, the fire land, <laughs> Svartalheim or something. I don't know. But anyway, Niflheim is the ice side and Niflheim is Nephilim. And the fallen angels is when that part of the Milky Way falls under the horizon. And that's the simplest way I can put it for now. But Niflheim, Nephilim, those aren't even connected cultures, supposedly. But you have the same word uh, referring to the same concept because the ice giants, the Jotun, were said to be... uh, you know, evil, <laughs> wicked, crafty. They came before humanity. And then there's gods and heroes and beings that mate with the ice giants or the Jotun to, you know, populate heroes and demigods and men of renown and gi- giants or half giants onto the earth in the Norse mythology. That's exactly the same as uh, Nephil- Nephilim. <laughs> it's, not, it's no different. And so it's all, it all traces back to astro theology. And uh, in my opinion, there's, you know, the, the good news is there's no evil alien extra dimensional thing coming to destroy you or trying to destroy you. But the, you know, there's also no savior coming to save you. It's just us here. And by us, I mean the one life force energy divine spark that is the I am presence and consciousness within each and every vessel that animates all material reality. So you don't believe... In the demiurge, the false reality, incarn- uh, reincarnation trap. Sorry, I was muted. No, I do not. I do not believe in that. Uh, that is a a wonderful. You could call it a psyop, or you could just say that this is like the natural expression of humanity's innate obstinacy you know, are the side of us or the part of us that wants to reject responsibility and just say, it's their fault. They did it to me. You know, this is the big picture victim consciousness. It's like, it's the, it's the bankers. It's the Jews. It's the Jesuits. It's the Vatican. It's the gray aliens. It's Cthulhu. It's the archons. And then it's the demiurge. It's like, you know, it's a whole string of of puppets puppeting the, the, the boogeyman below them. And then there's a bigger boogeyman above them. It just keeps going on and on until you reach the point where you're like the entire universe is designed to make me miserable. And that's like, you can't, you can't get to a more flat out rejection of your own personal responsibility than that. That is the ultimate victimhood, victim consciousness. And so I don't support that whenever it comes to the demiurge, the demiurge is a misunderstanding of the Trinity concept and the ancient, the ancient mythologies and wisdom traditions had this idea of a creator, preserver, destroyer, the three in one. This is back to the arc symbolism I was talking about. The arc being one of the penultimate versions of this trinity or this three in one because you have the boat, which is the hull or the whole or the yoni. The Hebrew word for boat is actually oni, O-N-I. The yoni is the Sanskrit or Hindu word for the female generative power or organ. And then the lingam or the mast is the phallus, right? It's the obelisk, that, that symbolism. And the riding on the boat is the savior or the Christ or Noah or whoever it is in, in whatever mythology, the flood hero. And the flood hero comes and repopulates or saves humanity after the destruction. 
we can get into like why they believed that there was this destruction and regeneration pattern. But essentially what is misunderstood about the Trinity is that the character of the destroyer is also the character of the regenerator. And that's the feminine component. So when we see in winter that everything dies, but that that death is necessary to clear space for things to regenerate and renew. That is how we know that this concept exists in nature. Although I'm not saying that people need to believe in the Trinity literally, or that it needs to be a part of their religion or spirituality. I'm just describing where this comes from and that the savior character is, uh, <laughs> the, okay. So all three in one are the demiurge, if you will. Demiurge means craftsman. Okay, so let's get into the astro theology of this real quick. There's the Hercules constellation, which is equatable with Zeus, uh, all the sky, sky gods, uh, Jehovah, Thor, etc. And this character in the sky, this Hercules constellation, if people look it up, you know, or if you look up old artwork, Grecian pottery, things like that, showing Zeus or like Chalk, the uh, the storm god of the Mayans or Indra at Gebekli Tepe, the guy holding the Vajra or the Thunderbolt, whichever he, whoever he happens to be, he's in this kneeling position and that indicate with the, the Thunderbolt over his head. And that indicates that we're looking at the Hercules constellation. Although you might have to go to the, uh, the H.E. Ray version of the constellation drawing. There's multiple ways to look at every constellation. And that's important because the alternate way to look at this Hercules constellation, the storm God is as a square or box, which would be the torso. And then the limbs are actually kind of like spiraling off of it, similar to a swastika. And so this is the primordial chaos or the swirling whirlpool or the whirlwind, the wind that the storm God is able to conjure and use or like, you know, versions of the deity that are taken up into heaven on a whirlwind of clouds. That's why this happens is because that same constellation that is the savior hero deity is also a vortex or a whirlwind or a whirlpool. And that's the primordial chaos from which everything comes. So because this redeemer savior aspect of the Trinity, the guy riding on the boat is also the chaos. The ancients called it chaos. Uh, that was the name of the, the three in one being in some, in some instances that the same being that is the savior is also the uh, maker of all things. Cause everything came from this primordial whirlpool of chaos, metaphorically speaking. And so that's why the demiurgos, a word in Greek, which means craftsman or maker that's related to this Hercules constellation because the, the worker or craftsman or laborer that is Hercules, he's another aspect of why he's kneeling is interpreted as he's like kneeling down to do agricultural work. And so, you know, that's like a quick overview of the symbolism, but uh, there's this symbolism is replete throughout all the different mythological and religious systems of the world. And the belief that the destroyer, or the devil is like this separate entity from God is a misunderstanding and also dem- demonstrable in the way that the feminine becomes the evil in the world. And like another example of this is in the, uh, cause the feminine part of the Trinity or the mother part of the Trinity is the destroyer and the regenerator. It's both. It's kind of a two in one in the three in one. <laughs> and then you, like, you can get into sacred geometry to explain this with the, the Vesica Pisces or the two circles, the monad becoming the duad. And then in between the monad and the duad is the Vesica shape, which is the portal through which the, the child or the third being of the Trinity is born. Um, you know, there's these goddesses of wisdom throughout all the cultures uh, that you know, are mythologized to have given humanity the ability to build boats or crafts or creations. Like Athena, for example, is one of these who is the, she gives people the boat. Like that's one of the technologies she's said to have invented technologies and crafts. She is a, thus she's a maker, which is what Demiurge means. And the mother figure is the father is the son. And a lot of these mythologies, the, the goddess marries her son. And then like, how does that work? You know, how can Jesus be his own father? All of that, you know, and it, 
What's jo- that? Hold on, Johnny. What are you? Well, yeah, I just die really quickly because this is something we talk about a lot. Um, do I go into the light or not? That's what I want to know. After at the moment of death, into the, is that a trick or is that where I should go? Uh, it's up to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> nobody will tell me. Well, uh, here's you know, my question. here's what I think, man. At the end of the day. It's you that you've got to face. So if you're afraid of the light, you're probably afraid of looking at yourself clearly in the mirror. I mean, this being of the the mother, the creator, creatrix, genetrix, she's also called Mary. She's called, when she's the mother of Adonis, she's called Mira. When she is the mother of Buddha or the mother of Mercury, oddly enough, the exact same name is Maya. And that she's, all, and that word Maya is said to mean illusion which this this Hindu corruption of the system is where we get a lot of the whole simulation theory, fallen world, everything's an illusion type of uh, issue, actually, Buddhism as well. And not that there aren't good things about those traditions. I'm not trying to shit on it all, but like, you know, uh, the, the idea that it's Maya or illusion is a misunderstanding, in my opinion, of the fact that the physical reality is the Maya or Mira or mirror of your inner world, of your true self. And we need this physical world to see ourselves clearly. I mean, you can't see yourself without a reflection. What's the first thing that humans were able to see themselves in as a reflection? It was the water. Oh. Well, what's the name for water? Mar, Mare, Mary, Mother Mary. You know, the, the all these savior deities, they're the son of the sea because they come off of the boat and the boat is mm-hmm. the mother. Right. So it, it goes it goes on and on. No, but like everything's that. interconnected. I get it all. So my question is, so we have real world we can sit there and go, everything is the stars, and I, I'm fine with that. I mean, you listen to the Vedics, like I don't know if you're in astrology, but the Vedics talk about entities being trapped here by the gods. So like it just like this gets in like I don't think we're ever supposed to know really what's going on. Like I just think that again, getting to the center of that onion. Like you mean we'll never know like the meaning of life. Well, like what is real and what is not real. That's why I think because like you know if we're going off the stars, like are you into ast- astrology? Chance. Oh, super, super uh, deep into astrology as a system of understanding yourself and nature. We got a series going on on my channel right now where a couple of friends of mine who are masters at herbalism are doing a 12 part once a month show where we cover the doctrine of signatures for the herbs that relate to that zodiacal sign. It's really useful information because you can see how even in nature, this idea of the the qualities of each of all the different times of year and how the structure of the plants reflect that and how if you have the if you're looking at plants through a symbolism or green language type of lens that you can actually intuit what those plants are good for and how you might use them. And I believe this is how the ancients really gained their wisdom about herbalism and folk remedies and all that is that at a certain point we had a more direct experience of our intuition and our connection to all things. And yeah. So anyway, what you're talking about in regards to like, you know, entities and other beings, things trapped here. I am talking, when I talk about what's real, I'm talking about physical shared reality. Now what people experience in their subjective reality in dreams and psychedelic experiences and visions out of body, all of that stuff that is subjective. I don't discredit the importance and validity of those experiences for the individual having them, but those are not real in the sense of, you know, concrete nature that we can all see, touch, feel, taste here. No, I, I think there's what an you're important saying. distinction between those two things. And like, you know, I, I don't disagree with the idea that maybe there are types of egregoric entities, psychic entities created with mass belief and in, in, in infusing and creating them on the psychic level. I mean, <laughs> I think that there's a good, a good argument for that, but that those beings are, in any way more powerful than us or can control us, that is a lie. That is an illusion. We created them. We are the source of that. You know, it's our imagination. The imagination is the primary, the, the grounds of all reality. Uh, like my favorite way to describe imagination is that imagining is not a 
form of thinking, all thinking is a form of imagination. Mm. And that's what I think the realm is in this hermetic sense of like the all is mind. I think that there's really just one of us here. <laughs> there's the, there's one life force energy. There's one unified, you know, source, light, infinite energetic principle of existence, all the names for Yahweh, uh, the translations for Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton, all reduced down to the, uh, the principle of existence itself, the, that which causes its own self to be, to be, you know? And then back to that, I want to attack something that I, I left out when I was describing the whole mother is the father is the son Trinity thing and the doctrine of that. That we're, we're probably familiar with the Tetragrammaton, right? The Hebrew Yad Hey Vav Hey, Y H V H, Jehovah, Yay, Yah, that guy. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, let, get specific about it. Like, let me get specific about it. So that's the he, what's considered the Hebrew name for God is this four letter name that the Hebrew letters are Yad Hey Vav Hey. And it's transliterated usually as either I E U E, which would be you which is incidentally, incidentally, that's how a Latin speaker or Norse speaker would pronounce J-E-W. They'd say you. <laughs> and you could also call him Yah. He shows up in a lot of places. But in the modern sense, we call it Jehovah. J and, uh, and that's because the Hebrew language didn't have vowel points. So people insert vowels in between those four letters and create Jehovah. But because the Yod, He, Vav, He, those four letters can transliterate into English, into different potential letters like the yod could be an e it could be an i you know etc that yod hey vav hey another way to transliterate that besides jehovah is actually i e v e which would be eve or eve so god yah yahweh jehovah is literally eve <laughs> it's the same word <laughs> And Eve means life, which is also the same in Hebrew. That means life, which is the same meaning as attributed to Jehovah or YHVH, which is the principle that causes things to be or exist. So like if you have the, my, my buddy Gabriel at the slick dissident channel on YouTube, he, he likes to say philology is lock picking. And I could not agree more because if you have philology, if you understand how Hebrew letters transliterate into more than one potential English word, then you can set up alternate ways of transliterating those words. Like Moshe, Moses is Messiah. <laughs> it's the same word, you know, it's Jesus is Moses. So they're all the same guy allegorized. I mean, Moses, what, where was he found? He was in a basket floating down a river. That's the boat. That's the ark. It's the same story. I find it super interesting. I find it all super interesting. I think they're I so we go over the again to this Grammy and this uh, fat ass named Sam Smith shoving himself into some devil clothing. Whatever he is trying to do which is I think edge lord shit. But there seems to be some sort of entity these people are worshiping these this darkness that they do to children and what they're doing like i wonder did we manifest that uh you know we talk you know you read and you talk to people about how our our thoughts affect p things f the physical our our energy our life force affects the physical are we manifesting dark entities into the world by play, by having these idiots play this stupid game. I think playing it means watching watching whatever the fuck it is, even for the Super Bowl. Are we but, playing? But but are they manifesting this stuff by doing these things, by throwing up these symbols, by saying these words and all that stuff? Are we bringing in darkness into this reality, whatever reality this might be? Let me answer that with a return to the topic of tuning actually. So I, I'm not opposed to the idea or the descriptor of possession, attachment, demonic entities, but like, let's get down to the bottom of what that actually means. In the philological linguistic sense, a demon, de mon, to mind, de mon, to mind. So what we're describing is a divided being. 
And what makes anything vampiric is that it's cut off from the source of life force energy and it needs to internally and it needs to vampirize or feed on it in somebody else. And uh, so I've done a lot of research on psychic vampirism, how that affects the aura. It's been demonstrated with curly in photography. Uh, there's a really great book called Psychic Vampires by Joel Slate that actually has the curly in photography of people's energy field before and after vampiric interactions. And you can see how like oh. psychic vampirism or energy vampires and people that juice each other are like actually sending out a, a dark tendril and puncturing the aura of the other person and then draining their energy. And that's not to freak people out. It's actually all consensual. <laughs> the victim has to let them in just like the old mythology of the psychic vampire. The issue is that really well practiced psychic vampires who do it on purpose, they know how to trick others into being comfortable with them and letting them in energetically and then flipping the table and juicing them at the last minute. Like if you've ever had an interaction with somebody, maybe you just had recently met them or they're at the party and like they, they're praising you or they're acting really interested in you and you're feeling a good vibe off of them and they're building you up. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, they just like overturn what you just said or like harshly come down on you or do something where you're surprised at like, whoa, that was a real flip of the script and the vibe. And then all of a sudden you're like not able to think straight. You can't form your words. You're like, uh, 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 and they're just crushing you. <laughs> That's what psychic vampirism feels like in a microcosm. And there are, you know, you can learn about this. There are consistent tricks and techniques that energy vampires use in order to get into your bubble space and then juice you. And it's good to know about that stuff so that you can uh, be aware that you not do it yourself to others and be aware of when somebody might be setting you up to juice you so that you're not vulnerable to it. But why I bring this up is that your energy field, your aura is consciousness. It's your life force. It's selfhood. And so you know, and the psychic vampire, vampire does more damage to themselves than they do to anybody else because they're fucking up their own energetic system by feeding on the energy of others rather than being animated by their own inner core, their own central column. And whenever we have this compartmentalized energy in our aura, our biofield, our bubble that gets intense enough, it can actually, it's basically no different than a demon being attached to you or possessing you. And it's important to understand this maxim of all is self, that all life force energy is one life force energy. It's one I am. That's what God is. It's the, to, to, the, the totality of all divine sparks in one infinite white light or clear light. And whenever our energy fields have these divisions and compartments set up of walls and dams and vort like you know separated vortexes if you have enough of your self energy shunted off into like a a dark closet <laughs> that you never go into well that energy is consciousness and so if it's been separated from its source which is you then it becomes a demon i mean metaphorically but in a sense quite literally that they're you could be, and then people, many people are carrying around fragments of their self that have been so cut off from light and life, which is awareness, because the person is not aware of that part of themselves that they're hiding from themselves, that it actually takes on a mind of its own. And it becomes like the you know devil on your shoulder whispering shit in your ear, like to do bad stuff. So you don't believe and in the demonic possession and anything like that. Like when somebody no, I'm saying I'm saying that you can explain it through the mechanics of your own energy field and energy body. And then if you expand that out into the realm itself being a big body, then, yeah, I mean, there could be <laughs> there could be that type of thing going on on a, a, a macro scale. The way that is happening in your own energy field, energy body, the whole earth is a big biofield as well. And then even like regions may have, but it's like Russian dolls. It's wheels within wheels within wheels. And so, yeah, I mean, there could be that going on, but I'm explaining it through the mechanism of how life force energy flow dynamics work. And you know, learning about fluid dynamics as a science, like Victor Schauberger and all that will give you a great a great approximation of how energy flows in all forms, including in the subtle realm. And the subtle informs the gross. So 
you know, just the way that your own personal life force energy can become separated and splintered off and become a separate entity in your bubble space that feels like it's following you around and fucking with you. Yeah, I, I entertain the possibility that that could exist on a larger scale. But my point is that that's the exception. That's the aberration. That is not the rule. And that there's no power that that type of separated energy or demonic consciousness has over us that we didn't give it, that we can't revoke right away. So it's not, you know, it's not a poor me. The demons are getting coming after me. It's like... I set up this dynamic of being persecuted by myself and it feels like the demons and you can describe it that way and you wouldn't be symbolically or metaphorically wrong, but the key is to reclaim your power in your own decision that that, that's not how I'm operating. You know, I'm not in a demonic realm. I'm not in a state of separation. Nothing is, nothing has any influence over me that I don't give influence over me with my own belief. Do you believe in reincarnation? I do not know. I could I could see it being either way. It could be like maybe we do go sort of through a storyline of multiple life incarnations, or maybe all incarnations are the same one being incarnating infinitely simultaneously throughout all the present moments of past, present, and future. You know, it could go either way. Um, I'm not opposed to the doctrine of reincarnation, but in terms of the way that uh, priest classes have used things like the promise of the reward in the next life or heaven or, you know, just be a good slave now and we'll, you'll be, you'll be rewarded next time around. Like I'm not into that. I'm into like making this life as good as possible. So I don't worry too much about reincarnation, not against the idea, but uh, I'm not convinced on the idea. I'm just going to say, I don't know. I find it interesting because we know there is like a predator class. Like, I mean, we could say there's not, but how do we explain? Oh, no, there is. There are people that, are, that act predatorily, yeah. Like, But a group of people that through time seems to be, whether we call them the Venetians, the Phoenicians, the Malachians, whatever these, this group is, like, and, they, and then they, they seem to be working this through generations, generation after generation after generation. And they have a goal that, that they believe is going to be set and achieved. And it doesn't matter if it's achieved in their lifetime. It could be achieved in another lifetime or their children's lifetime or their children's children's lifetime. You know, it's why Klaus Schwab, his dad was a Nazi and like all the stuff that that guy got into. And then his son picks up the mantle and keeps it going. I think does Fauci have a son. Yeah. Fauci has a daughter. That is in the family business. Oh, see, that's the same bullshit. And that, that is the same bullshit. But something's going on there. There's something going on there. And I don't well, know. That's how a great to- point. Uh, this is a good point, Sam. And, you know, I've this is just speculation. So this isn't like I'm making a claim, but I would not be surprised if reincarnation was real or at, similar to what is described. Or maybe there's a, what I think could possibly be going on just in, in wild high octane speculation. And this has probably been said by other people before, but that maybe there are secret techniques for preserving your memory on death oh. and then being able to choose your next incarnation and thus, or maybe rituals that can be performed to bring a certain aspect of soul with a certain memory field back into incarnation and in the next generation, the next baby. I think that that's actually not not totally crazy or impossible, especially when you consider near death experiences, out of body experiences. Like I myself have had, I've left my body before, looked down at it from above and held on to all my knowledge of who I was until the point where I kind of blacked out or forgot to pay attention and lost consciousness. So I think there is a very high value in practices that train you to hold your attention for longer and longer periods of time. And that attention is coherence in your energy field. And it may take a, <laughs> it may take more work than we have the ability to achieve in, in one lifetime, maybe in future lifetimes, you'll get it. Maybe that's what reincarnation is about, but that yeah, I think that it is possible and plausible that a, 
a highly developed consciousness with an extreme level of coherence and unity in their own energy field that when that energy field, its body expired, that it could retain its own shape in a, you know, outside the body and not be reabsorbed into the one or into the ocean of pure consciousness and instead, you know, continue to be its own individual self and maybe choose and chart its course through those seas of infinity and wind up in a specific body in a new place exactly where they want to be. Or maybe we don't need to go through all that uh, extra work and maybe in, you know, the space between lives, whatever that is, we get to choose what we do next, no matter what. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So I I don't make claims about what I don't know about, but I do think, you know, the, the long game of the powers that were (laughs) powers that should not be uh, definitely the generational aspect of that could be a clue that some people have preserved a technique or a knowledge of how to control their incarnations into the future. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't rule that out. I mean, if you believe that the pyramids are temples, they used to put the pharaohs in with the stuff that they owned, so that they would go back into the other life with their materials that they had now. Well, they didn't do that. That was a. That yeah, was, was a, if you believe if you believe what they say yeah, that the, that yeah. it's a temple, which we all know yeah. not. But that the logic was like, hey, put in my car, so when I le- yeah. die, I can. Oh, have that my was car. that's idiotic. I can't yeah. Well, I mean, that's a psyop. Yeah. That's a lie. Yeah. Uh, that's there's a lie. so much gravel and lie about the about ancient Egypt. I think it's possible that a lot of ancient quote unquote ancient Egypt is like Hollywood props, <laughs> but we won't go, we, we won't go well, there. Cause I'm not, I'm not prepared discussion itself as well. But, um, it, uh, it is, um, super interesting and it just gets into, if this is a realm of consequences, what is making it consequential? Uh, it, there's, there's something at work and I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is. I don't. I don't. I think it's whatever these meat suits are. I don't know if we're allowed to figure out what the answer is. I I don't. I don't know. uh, So I guess we'll find out when we go to the other side. I just know, and I say this all, uh, all the time, is when I do certain things, my life vibrates better, right? And even though I'm going through some shit right now, that falls under the, this is a realm of consequences. This is a realm of consequences. What is making those consequences? What is making it so I just feel like the world's coming down on me when I know it's not. And I know that this is just me learning lessons from the universe, that the universe is warning me, telling me, if you keep doing this, this is going to happen. What do you even mean when you say that, though, by the universe there? what do you? Because you're, you're kind of projecting some consciousness onto it. Like, it's warning me. You know, that's like a Yeah, a I, do believe, right? I do yeah. believe it is a consciousness of God. Possibly we're in the head of God. Possibly we're in the playground of God. Possibly yeah. we're in this the fourth level of uh, existence, which the Vedics think is... The lowest form, which could be the material world. Well, the, you know, the Norse mythology, back to the Gananga Gap thing, <laughs> that when the ice giant Ymir was slain, by the way, Ymir is also Yama, who is Hades. Uh, well, I'll leave that there for now. But when Ymir was slain and his body was fashioned into the material world, that his skull was where Midgard was placed. And so that is very interesting because... Like, for example, Jesus Christ is crucified at Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. It's up here. It's in your head. I think the material universe is in our head. It's a mental plane. (laughs) And that the even idea of the dome, you know, of the firmament, which is an arch or an arc, is very revealing because the Greek word arche, which is applied to the word archon, meaning a ruler or a head of something as in a head like above, like the the top of a, a power structure. Arke also means wisdom. And we see this interplay between wisdom and an arc and a ruler or a head in other languages as well. In particular, I find it fascinating that in Genesis 1, 1, the King James version gives you in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
But if you go into the Hebrew, it's actually, it says, Barashit, which means, that's the first words. And that actually means by wisdom, by wisdom. And then it goes on to say in the Hebrew, in a more direct translation, by wisdom, the Elohim, plural, created the earth from materials previously existing. And to me, that makes perfect sense. Uh, in terms of the mystery tradition of the ancients, especially when you consider that the word earth is actually uh, more anciently was Artha, which is a corruption or a derivation on Arga, Arca, Arche, the Ark. <laughs> the earth, earth is the Ark of, you know, the, the boat that we're all riding on and it's the big arc and then our bodies are the little arc. <laughs> and uh, like, I mean, yeah, Eartha, uh, that word in, in correlation to the idea of an arc or a vault or wisdom, uh, it goes in throughout many languages. I believe in the, even in the, Oh, here's another example. So I said, Rasit, the Hebrew word for wisdom. Well, in Arabic Rashid, which is basically the same word means head. So, it goes on. It is a, 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 a real enigma. It's a tangled web. I think that it's giving us a clue that we are in our head. We're in our own head, and that that head, the head of everything, is the mind of God. And then that's where everything is playing out, that this is all a uh, psychodrama dream of the infinite source consciousness that is the self-existing eternity of all things. What happens when God wakes up? <laughs> well, that actually like, is part of the story of the Ark. Like the original doctrine, the Brahminical version of the Ark narrative or mythos is that at the point where, uh, and this relates like an example would be um, Net, uh, Nut and Geb in the Egyptian mythology. That's the earth and the sky. They were like having sex <laughs> And so there was no, they were continually having sex or they were continually together. So the masculine and feminine principles were united. And that meant that there was no spark between them, no generation, no existence, no physical manifest reality. And the metaphor was that if the earth and sky were flattened together and together, you know, doing it, that they couldn't, there was no room for life to exist. And so Nut uh, and Geb were separated by Shu. And Shu is the moist air. And what I find interesting about that too is that like, you know, Shu separated earth and sky <laughs> and uh, we wear shoes that separate our feet from the earth, oddly enough. But and the rubber. Anyway, so yeah, rubber. Oh, uh, rubber you wear, you wear, shoes are made of rubber and you put a rubber on your penis that separates the masculine and the feminine oh, principle yeah. during sex. You know, yeah. like it's, it goes on, but um, this, th this idea so of... Deep. And it just can't be, I don't know, man. I just, I think it's all interest. I think the stars, I'm totally into that. I'm totally into astrology. I'm also into Christian mysticism. I'm into all that stuff. I just find it interesting. And I just had to go, we'll never know the real answer. Because it's just, I mean, who knows how long humanity's been around. If we're talking, let's let's say humanity's been around 50,000 years, maybe. Let's say I well, let me let me finish what I was saying though about the arc of the Brahminical system, and you said like what happens when God wakes up because this is what they believed that at the point where the uh, the the creative the masculine generative principle and the feminine generative principle come back together and no longer have a separation, which is duality, which is the physical manifest world. It's front, back, left, right, up, down, all of these dualistic dimensions that we exist within. When they collapse back down into the oneness that they actually are, that is the arc. That is the mast, the phallus, and the yoni, the hull of the boat. And that when that happened, the boat is now floating on the primordial chaos of of sort of unmanifest reality because the generative principles are no longer creating that spark of life or existence or having that space between them. So this is really interesting because a lot, uh, a lot of versions of the name of the savior who rides on the boat have to do with the idea of a spark, you know, a spark between the poles, a spark, how a battery works, a positive and negative pole, the uh, Eros, the God Eros, is, no, is actually philologically the exact same as 
Horus or Christ. And I can explain that, that E-R-O-S is in Greek, the letter Eta, and then Rho, which is R, and then Omicron Sigma. But in the Hebrew, it's H-R-S, Chet, Resh, Shen. And that's where you get Horus, H-R-S. It's where you get horses. <laughs> it's where you get uh, even Christ is is related to that because the Chet could also be a, a uh, he in Greek, which is like an X, but that tr- transliterates into other languages, giving you a C or a CH. So instead of ERS, it becomes HRS, and then that becomes CHRS. That's Chris or Christ or Christos, Christus. So the interesting thing is how the... Uh, the ones who understand the symbolism in throughout history have at, at one point, whenever the mafia took it all over, <laughs> it's funny because the word in Greek crest, crestos, not, not Christos, but crestos as the early church fathers applied the name Christians, not Christians, Christians to their followers. That means good. So crestos or Christians are the good men or the good fellas. So the early church fathers were literally calling themselves good fellas, which is what we call the, ma- the Italian mafia now That's in hilarious. like Hollywood movies. But they were able to sort of utilize this principle of the erotic force or the sexual spark of energy between the masculine and feminine to control that, repress that. And that was the, that always has been the main control switch of how people are, you know, either falling or ascending whether they're maintaining that spark, cultivating it, keeping the spark lit, hot, alive, or they're just squirting all the time, draining their own sexual energy, loosing themselves. Story of my life. (laughs) Story of my life. There's it's just super. I mean, it's so deep, dude. It's so deep, you know, and it's just like uh, these stories are told and just, You know, at the end of the day, you got to look inside yourself and fix yourself. And then you fix people around you. I I don't know what the answers are anymore. I, I, you know, this is, this episode has been amazing and I leave it with more questions than I came in with. Happy to come back. Just let me know what you want to talk about. I'll prepare something next time. This was all off the top of my head. And it's just, you know, all, uh, you know, Christ consciousness. I just like, we're all connected and, you know, this auras and all this stuff. It's just so interesting, man. So it was a great conversation, dude. Chance, I really appreciate you coming on. I uh, want you one more time tell them where they can find you. Yeah, I hope people will come check out innerversepodcast.com. Follow me on YouTube and Rockfin. I'm on Odyssey, BitChute, all that as well. We do a Wednesday show called Vibrant. That's a lot of fun. It's a live show, community input. You can call in. We have a lot of fun with that. And then my weekly show, Innerverse, goes on usually Sundays or Mondays. Been doing that more live too because I just really like the energy of live. But there's tons of content there where you can brush up on your knowledge of astronomy, astrology, astrotheology, philology, energy, mechanics, you know, how to, how to get really radically honest about who you are and where you're at. And that's great. That's the sound healing tab right there where you can find more information about booking a ceremony with me. And this is a great technique for being able to find the stuck energy that you've been hiding from yourself. And it really does help to have that sort of ex external person as a technician where you're asking them to help you find something that you may not have noticed. And it's just been right under your nose the whole time. And you know, you probably won't puke. (laughs) You'll probably have a lot of fun getting a tuning with me. They always are a great time. And people have reported incredible results. Like, you know, real quick, like the, one of the wild results that happened recently was a guy who had a, a leg length discrepancy of six inches is an older guy. And one of his legs was six inches longer than the other one. And after the tuning within three days, his legs were the same length and his chiropractor Damn. couldn't believe it. He was like, what happened? <laughs> so yeah, lots of, lots of opportunities to learn over on my channel and hopefully a lot of fun too. So I hope people will come check it out. All right, man. Well, we appreciate your chance. It was great. Hope you guys Thanks enjoyed for having it. me on and a uh, shout out to Mark Steves for, for booking this. Uh, he's a good friend. I love that guy. Yeah, Mark Steve, good guy, crazy person, <laughs> good dude. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody for tuning in. Again, go to samtriplee.com. Man, my dates, my weirdo tour is uh, is filling up. I'm, I just had a couple dates, but I'm going to be in Morris Plains. 
uh, and again, the 17th, 16th through the 18th, going to be in the uh, at the World Famous Comedy Store, Spokane, Tacoma, Minneapolis. And then I got more dates coming, San Diego. Uh, I'm doing Yuma, Arizona. Just booked that. Las Vegas for a private. But we're working on all these dates, and uh, hopefully we'll be to a serious a city near you. Come get weird. Check out, again, samtriplee.com for anything you need, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care and goodbye. All right, guys, real quick before we're done, we want to tell you about all of our affiliates. It's a great way to support the show. Uh, as you know, uh, fiat money is chaos. Okay, fractional reserve banking, dangerous. The best way to get out of it is precious metals, in particular, silver and gold, silver and gold. And that's why we're working at Wise Wolf, okay? Wise Wolf, silver and gold. Just go to samtriplee.com or samtriplee.gold and you could join. And uh, the, he's hooking you up. They got great pro that you can either buy single time or you can sign up for their program where you can buy up to $500 a month. I'm doing it. I hope you can too. We also have... Everybody at Eagle Research, that's right, Eagle Research, AquaCure Mobile Model AC50 Brown Gas, Hydrogen Brown Gas. Uh, the guy who makes it says it's secure. People are using it. Check it out. Just go there, use the, the, the promo code Tin foil hat, three words, and get a discount. Go back to the main page, Sam Tripoli. You will get, uh, yeah, you get a discount with the promo code Tin foil. And then our good friends over at Haley Ray Crystal Shop Go to the, the promo code is Swarm, Swarm fifteen. 15. Get fifteen percent off, off all your crystals, all your quartz, all uh, you name it. What do we got here? Look at all this stuff. All this stuff. All the best. You can do it right there. It's all part of the best crystal shop on the internet. Jewels, bracelets, clusters, you name it. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Candles. You name it. You got it. Swarm 15. Thank you for supporting the show. We love you. And uh, thank you so much for your support. We go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink. From the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Tim foil hack, tin 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 foil hack.